This presentation is on the history of Kingston Museum, since 1973 a Grade II listed building. It covers the construction of the museum and its history up to the present day. Kingston Museum and Library are very much connected, physically as well as historically, though this presentation only covers the museum in detail. Lord Rosebery officially opened Kingston Museum on Monday the 31st of October 1904. He announced that, with a library, a museum and an art gallery of this scope and capacity, we have a building which should be a centre of intellectual illumination for the borough and for the district. From the 1880s, many leading Kingston residents were in favour of establishing a library and a museum in the town, especially Frederick Gould, who was mayor of Kingston twice. He donated a mass of archaeological and historical objects, which formed the beginnings of the museum's collection. Another founding collection was the Mybridge Collection, bequeathed to the museum by photographic and moving picture pioneer Edward Mybridge in 1905. Kingston's first public library was established in temporary accommodation in 1882. Kingston Council raised a loan to finance a permanent building for the library on the Fairfield in 1903. At this time Fairfield was used for allotments. The council asked Scottish-American industrialist and philanthropist Andrew Carnegie to fund part of the library's construction. Carnegie generously offered to pay the entire amount, which enabled the council to use the loan to build a museum in addition to the library. Carnegie funded the building of a staggering 2,811 libraries in Britain and the US. Mayor Henry Minnett laid the museum's foundation stone on the 30th of March 1904 and the museum opened at the end of October. The building consisted of a space for permanent displays at the front, a lecture hall at the back and a first floor art gallery. Its primary purpose was educational. Both museum and library were designed by architect Alfred Cox, who aimed to make the layout simple and well lit. Historic England gives a number of reasons for listing the building. Firstly, its architectural interest. It's built in a style copying the late 17th century architecture of Christopher Wren, popular circa 1890 to 1914. The library and museum are both buildings of a harmonious design. Historical interest. It was established thanks to the philanthropy and determination of Kingston citizens and is one of the first English libraries funded by Andrew Carnegie. Taken together, the buildings form a good early 20th century example of a public library, museum and art gallery complex surviving in continuous use. Interior. The original layout of the main library area remains, as does the essential plan of the museum. The museum has an imposing staircase with high quality joinery and a top lit picture gallery complete with integral picture rails. Intactness. The buildings survive remarkably intact, both externally and internally, retaining original windows and stacks, as well as architectural stonework and terracotta. And there is also the group value, with the fragment of medieval pier known as King John's Pillar thought to originate from the Palace of Kings, which stands outside the library, and with a number of nearby listed buildings, including the former telephone exchange and head post office and the former police station. Entering into the museum reception, visitors first encounter the shop. Throughout the shop and the first gallery, the Ancient Origins Gallery, you can see stained glass windows. These were taken from the old town hall in the marketplace when the new guild hall opened in its current location in 1935. The windows were designed by Mayor W. E. St. Lawrence Finney, who was also a local historian. One of the windows incorporates 17th century glass from the Tudor guild hall. This one shows the May Games, a celebration which is supposed to have taken place annually in Kingston in medieval times. 
Mayor Finney, depicted here in the centre with a dark beard, was one of Kingston's most active supporters. Mayor on seven occasions, he successfully petitioned George V for Kingston to be designated the Royal Borough of Kingston-upon-Thames. Finney donated many significant objects to the museum, which are still on display there today, including an Anglo-Saxon log boat, a Roman altar and traders' tokens dating from the English Civil War. To imagine what the museum looked like when it first opened, you need to picture showcases filled with prehistoric items, natural history specimens such as stuffed birds and mounted insects, oriental and Mexican objects, and Martin Ware pottery. Many of these exhibits had no local connections, beyond being loaned by Kingston residents. This photograph from 1904 shows the inaugural exhibition of paintings in the art gallery, most of which were on temporary loan, including an oil painting by Constable and etchings by Whistler. The museum was managed by the library when it first opened. This painting depicts Benjamin Carter, who was borough librarian at this time, up until 1926. He became friends with Edward Mybridge when Mybridge returned to Kingston from America during the last 10 years of his life, and this probably contributed to Mybridge's decision to donate his personal collection of photographic equipment and objects to the museum. This gift makes up a third of the museum's total collection. In 1959, the first professional museum curator, Miss P. Fraser Brunner, was appointed. She came up with a collecting policy along contemporary lines, which focused on collecting material particular to the town of Kingston. From 1965, when the London boroughs changed boundaries, curators had to focus more widely on collecting from the whole borough. Between 1992 and 1997, two new permanent galleries were developed on the ground floor of the museum in which to display the collections. These are still in place. The Ancient Origins Gallery, where some of the stained glass windows are located, tells the story of Kingston from prehistory to Anglo-Saxon times. It leads into the town of King's Gallery, which displays objects showing Kingston's development as a market town. The town of King's Gallery was built as a lecture hall. It held up to 200 people and hosted talks and events and screened films, drawing considerable audiences in the days before television became popular. Local organisations also hired the hall for meetings. It then became a library reading room and later the local history room. During the 1990s redevelopment, this double height room had its skylights blacked out. Its vaulted roof and stage complete with sink used during scientific lectures are no longer visible. This doorway and fan light, leading from the shop to the stairwell, are original to the building. There is a symmetrical second set on the other side of the wall, leading from one gallery to the next. The wooden staircase, noted by Historic England as a feature of the building, leads from the ground floor, outside the permanent galleries, up to the art gallery. The purpose-built art gallery offers a programme of changing exhibitions. The gallery is lit by a large skylight window, which gives excellent illumination, but, less desirably, makes the space heat up like a greenhouse during hot weather. If you look up, you can see the faces and wings of plasterwork cherubs on the beams supporting the roof. You can see the original tiered picture rails running around the gallery walls, designed for the hanging of many pictures grouped together. Contemporary displays usually leave more space around the items. Many local groups of artists and photographers or representing particular communities have held exhibitions of their work in the art gallery. For a while, during the 1980s, it was used as the local history search room. The library and museum are described in art historian Nicholas Pevsner's architectural guide to the area. Kingston Library, quite pretty, brick, 
Neo-Georgian, nine bays wide and with a big portal. Museum and art gallery round the corner from the library. A handsome, small red brick building with pilasters, blind arches on the upper floor, corresponding to the gallery inside. The museum is built of red brick on a stone base. The roofs are tiled and have wooden eaves. The facade faces east and it's decorated with four ionic brick pilasters with stone bases and capitals. The base of one of these pilasters is carved to commemorate the laying of the foundation stone in 1904. Above the main entrance is a carved arch of bath stone and the niche above it was supposed to hold a bust or sculpture, as were the brick recesses on either side of it, though they never have. If you stand back and look up at the building, you can see a timber belvedere with a balustrade and a weather vane on top. It's a replica of the original, which was removed in 1971 when it deteriorated and was replaced in 1997. A few of the building's lead drain pipes remain. You can see one here near the right corner. The railings surrounding the museum and library were melted down for metal during World War II and replaced following the war. There were once gates to the museum entrance, which the library still has. In front of the museum is a coal post, it's seen here as a brown object to the right of the main entrance. It indicates the point at which coal duty became payable to the Corporation of London, though it has been moved from its original site. The cast iron bollard is marked George IV Rex, so dates from 1820 to 30. The main road outside the museum was built as a relief road in 1998 and cut off part of the museum's garden. At this time, the road changed its name from Fairfield West to Wheatfield Way. This pillar outside the library is known as King John's Pillar. It was discovered near the Clatton Bridge when digging the foundations for a new building. Mayor E. Coppinger claimed it for his garden, which was on the site of the Palace of Kings, also known as King John's Palace. So this is where the pillar got its name. However, its owner took it to Surbiton with him before finally donating it to the Public Library and Museum. Pevsner dates the pillar to around 1300 AD. Thank you for listening to this presentation and do come and visit the museum when we reopen. You can check opening times on our website.